Welcome to part one of a special two-part edition of Thoughts on the Market. I'm Michael Zizis, Head of Public Policy Research and Municipal Strategy for Morgan Stanley. And I'm Ellen Zentner, Chief U.S. Economist for Morgan Stanley Research. On this special edition of the podcast, we'll be talking about Congress's response to the coronavirus impact on the economy. It's Wednesday, April 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So, Ellen, it seemed like it was just a few weeks ago that Congress passed the CARES Act, which was two trillion plus dollars of economic aid. And now we're on the precipice of adding another 400 to 450 billion dollars backfilling money to the CARES Act. And most of that money seems like it's going to be going to backfilling loans for small businesses. Why are we here again? Why do you think this is important? Well, I think you and I have talked about this in the past. You know, the small businesses are the backbone of the economy. They employ 60 percent of the labor market. And so it was important to get money to them in order to try to help them through this difficult time as quickly as possible. Now, obviously, there was a great need because why are we here talking about more funds for small businesses. It's because that initial program was exhausted so quickly with more than a million applications approved, eating up that $350 billion that was initially allotted to it very quickly. So the need is there, and clearly this program needed to be expanded. But at the outset, it's all about giving businesses the best chance of reopening on the other side of these most negative impacts from coronavirus. You do that and you give the economy the best chance for bringing the unemployment rate down more quickly. Yeah, I think it's pretty impressive and somewhat surprising that we're getting another slug of money so quickly. Congress doesn't typically act this fast. And I think it underscores what you said, which is both the economic importance and, and frankly, probably the political importance of the small business community, and the amount of employment that it provides to the U.S. economy. Yeah, and I think if we put it in the context of it's not just Congress providing the support, but the Fed providing the support as well, because collectively policymakers understand that this is a big demand shock. And a big demand shock can be followed by a relatively quick recovery unless it turns into a balance sheet recession. And so what we're going to notice is that most of these policies are all geared toward keeping balance sheets that were healthy going into this downturn healthy coming out of the downturn. Think about what happened after 2008. We went into that downturn extremely leveraged on the part of household balance sheets. So our debt to income ratios were extraordinarily high. Uh, And so after the downturn, we took households five years to deleverage. That is paying down debt, defaulting on debt, wiping the the slate clean, uh, and getting balance sheets into more healthy working order where debt was not overwhelming income. So today we went into this downturn with incredibly healthy balance sheets. Debt in this uh, expansion has not outpaced growth in income. Debt to income ratios are at their best levels since 20 years ago. Uh, And so we want to be sure to keep it that way so that when we come out of this downturn, households aren't again being faced with having to pair debt levels and retrench in that deleveraging cycle. I think it's fair to conclude that what it's trying to do is effectively set up the economy so that when the worst impacts of the virus are over, the social distancing impacts, et cetera, that people can effectively go back to normal. But do you think the economy will go back to normal that quickly? I mean, certainly we may be defining what normal looks like for some time here, watching the updates from the various governors each day on how they're going to approach opening up businesses again on the other side of this. And it could be a very slow process. Uh, We heard from uh, Governor Newsom of California giving a, a sense of what it could look like for restaurants, say, opening up and you take people's temperatures coming in the door and then a wait staff serves you with a mask and gloves with disposable menus. There's not only going to be that factor that might discourage more folks from the desire to go out to eat on the other side of this. But you also have a bit of a crisis of confidence on the other side of this, where many households won't feel safe for a time, even if it's available to go out to eat at restaurants. And so 
there are certain sectors of the economy that may be working at limited capacity uh, for a time. And so you're going to have to continue uh, to provide support for businesses or businesses are going to have to continue to stretch funds for as long as possible while we deal with this slow ramp back in activity. And we could be in that situation for a time while we wait for testing to be broadly available, therapeutic to be broadly available, and then ultimately a vaccine. So it sounds like you're saying that the economy is experiencing a sharp drop now and will rebound, but still the behaviors of individuals and companies will make it such that the economy is not going to be back to where it was the first quarter of this year until sometime in 2021, perhaps. Is that right? Yeah, so we're expecting nominal GDP to be back at previous levels uh, by the fourth quarter of next year. And so to put it in perspective, you know, it took 14 quarters to get back to flat, if you will, after the financial crisis. So eight quarters this time uh, is much faster than that, but it is a longer amount of time than, say, what we would consider in a garden variety downturn, just owing to the fact that the opening up the, of the economy may go more slowly. So I think this is an important point here because one of the questions that we get quite often is how much more is Congress willing to do? How much more is Congress likely to do? If we add up the amount that's likely to get passed this week with the CARES Act, we uh, probably spent about two and a half trillion dollars or about to spend two and a half trillion dollars in economic aid to the U.S. economy. But could there be more? And Congress is certainly signaling that they would like to do more. And in our view, there could be as much as another trillion dollars, perhaps more than that, depending on how long it takes the economy to normalize. That's because a lot of what's in this bill is effectively an extension of liquidity to small businesses, to households, uh, such that they, while social distancing is happening, aren't draining through their own reserves. And the story that you tell, Ellen, about the economy not fully normalizing for quite some time suggests that Congress is still going to be pumping some of this aid into the economy. Yeah, I think that's right. That, you know, it's a process of discovery. We think we know what the economic outlook will look like. We think we know what the process of normalization will look like. Um, but there are going to be holes, pockets, you know, things that Congress and the Fed will need to fill that may only become apparent over time in terms of how much more help is needed or just the extension of current programs and current help. So can you put it in context for us? If we're talking about two and a half trillion dollars so far, perhaps as much as three and a half trillion dollars, what does that look like historically in terms of a governmental response to a crisis? To the CARES Act, uh, you add another, say, one and a quarter trillion dollars in spending to that, which, as you've noted, is perfectly plausible. Uh, and you can get to a 24 percent deficit to GDP ratio this year. That far surpasses what we saw at the peak in 2009. You're starting to go past the levels that we saw around World War II. This is really unprecedented support for an unprecedented sharp downturn. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in your feed soon with part two of my conversation with Ellen Zentner. If you enjoy Thoughts in the Market, please take a moment to rate and review us on the Apple Podcasts app. It helps more people find the show. The preceding content is informational only and based on information available when created. It is not an offer or a solicitation, nor is it tax or legal advice. It does not consider your financial circumstances and objectives and may not be suitable for you.